Good morning, John Safari. I love worshiping with y'all. I love singing with y'all. I love just being in this place, see what God's doing in this season at uh, this special address. It's just, it's so great. Like, Taylor Swift has nothing on this place. I'm telling you right now, like, let's go, let's go. Uh, Her followers are called Swifties. I'm not gonna call y'all fairies, but whatever we are, we are better than that. All right, so um, I wanna encourage you, if you're new today, these listening guides help you take notes, but also if you wanna find ways to get connected, uh, there's a way to learn about that. And we're gonna be in Hebrews chapter 12 today, verses one through three, and probably what are some of the more famous verses in the New Testament. And we've called this series through Hebrews the race, And that's very appropriate because in today's passage in Hebrews 12, he's gonna talk about us running this race with with Jesus. I don't know how many serious runners we have in the room, people who do lots of races and train to do races. I've never been a great runner, never been a super serious runner. I, I did have a season where I tried to get into that and ran a couple different races. Right after college, I signed up to run my first half marathon. Um, and I didn't really train for it. In hindsight, that was a mistake. But I, I, I jogged a couple times, you know, maybe went on a long jog the weekend before the race or something. I, I knew I was gonna probably finish in the top 10, credible athletic ability. But um, actually my goal for the day was just not to quit. My goal was just make it through, that was my one goal. I didn't know anything about times or training, had just thought if I could just run the whole thing, that would be the great goal. And I made such a rookie mistake. I got up to the starting line, and if you've ever done one of these races, you know, they're pumping the music, and your heart rate's up, and you're going crazy, and you, you know, you're all warmed up, and you look across the start line, and, and there you are with all these guys that weigh like 115 pounds, right? And, 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 and I made this massive mistake, because when they took off, man, I took off with them. And we're running, I'm thinking, I got this, I got this, right, for about a mile, okay? Because... They kept going, and, and early on this race, I had to do what I didn't want to do, which was to stop running. And I think in a way, that's an appropriate analogy for what we're looking at today in Hebrews, because this was written originally to a bunch of people who wanted to stop running. That doesn't mean that these are people who are going to lose their salvation in Jesus, but it means that because of the persecution, because of how hard it was to follow Jesus, especially when their family members shamed them for doing so. Many of these original followers lost their jobs, lost homes. It was hard saying yes to Jesus. They were tempted to stop running. And today I wanna talk to you about what's it look like for us to keep our pace in this race with Jesus. In many ways, Hebrews chapter 12 is the end of an argument, at least the first three verses. If you go all the way back to chapter 10, verse 36, I think in many ways that's where this argument begins because he talks about this need for endurance. In chapter 11, he gives a litany of examples of people who walked by faith. And then in verses one through three of chapter 12, he turns the camera on you. And it's as if all those people who ran in chapter 11 are now handing the baton to you and say, it's your time to run. And so chapter 12 is dedicated to us, to those hearing this great word and running our race. Let's look together at verses one through three. If you would stand, I'd love to read for you Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through three. As I said, he's concluding, in many ways, an argument. So we start out with this key word, therefore. Verse one. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We'll talk about it in a minute, but I, I do wonder how many of you come into this place weary today, tempted to stop running. If so, I think God has a word for you. Father, as we now look into your word, I pray that you would convict us where we need to be convicted. You would comfort us where we need to be comforted. God, would your spirit work in a powerful way. Thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, you guys grab a seat. My hunch is, if you are a believer in Jesus or just somewhat familiar with the Bible, you have read this passage or parts of this passage. And I don't know exactly how your English translation lays out the passage, but if you were to study the original language that this was written in Greek, you would see very clearly that there is one main imperative to everything we just read in those three verses. One main idea, and that main idea, that main command or imperative is this. We are to run with endurance. That's what he's saying about what the Christian life is to be like. It is to be running with endurance. And I I put the Greek word for you and then kind of the English transliteration of it. It's a hupomone. Sometimes it's also written hupomeno. And it's a word, it's a very important word. It means to bear up under pressure to stand strong in a time of pressure or trial, to have endurance. The word was used back in verse 10, chapter 10, verse 36. It's also used in all three verses we just read. At the end of verse one, run with hupomone, endurance. Verse two, looking at Jesus who hupomone, endured the cross. Verse three, consider him who hupomone, endured such hostility. The whole point is that we as believers in Jesus would have the endurance that God wants us to have to run this life, which says something about what the Christian life is like. It is not a life of passive obedience, but the Christian life is one of action. Now, this is so important to understand, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus. Grace is opposed to earning. Here's what I mean. We are saved by the grace of God. We are not saved because we're good people. We're not saved because we go to a church a lot. We're not saved because we give a lot of money. We're not saved because we do a lot of really good things. We are saved because of the finished work of Christ on the cross and in his resurrection, and he has forgiven us for our sin, and he has given us everything that we might have a life of abundance and peace with him both now on this earth and forever. And there's nothing you can do to earn that. You merely by faith receive what he has earned for you, and that is the gospel, amen? So grace is opposed to earning. You can't earn grace, but, but. Grace is not opposed to effort. Meaning once you give your life to Christ and you are legitimately saved, the Bible, if we look at it in a balanced way, talks about the Christian life as a life of discipline, a life of training for godliness, a life of spiritual warfare, a life of difficulty. So the author here, talking to Christians, is saying that he wants you to run with endurance. Hupomone, to run with the ability to bear up under trial. So the Christian life is in many ways a slow grind, it's a process. Now we would rather the Christian life be one of just deliverance and breakthrough. And God at times does what feels immediate, but the normative pattern of scripture is that the Christian life is a slow, grinding, joy-filled process towards becoming the mature person he wants you to be. And we get that because that's true of, well, just about any endeavor, is it not? I mean, we're talking about running. If you wanna be a great runner, an elite runner, 
The elite runners of the world live a very disciplined life. They have to be very cognizant of the amount of sleep they get, the nutrition that they have, the weights they lift, the intervals they run, the elevation changes, their iron levels, their VO2 max. We go on, on and on, all these things they have to be very disciplined about to be an elite runner. The Christian life is the same. And the number one ways that God helps us to be mature is by giving us trials. Or to say it, Like James said it in chapter one, notice what he says. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces hupomone, endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God uses the trials of our life. A lot of you right now are in a trial. And God can use that trial to help you to be the person he wants you to be. That's why we consider it all joy. So today we're talking about keeping pace. And to help you think about this text in a way that might be a little bit more memorable for you, I've come up with an acrostic for pace, P-A-C-E. I never do those things just to be clever but I want them to stick into your brain. And so I've thought about, according to this text, how do you run with endurance? What's required for me to run with endurance the race that God has for my life? I think there are four requirements in this text, and I'll try to make them easier by just saying P-A-C-E. So let's just go down the list. P, what's the P stand for? People. People. Let's start back in verse one. He says, therefore, so coming off of 11, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Here he's most likely thinking about the early runners and when they would run in in kind of the precursor to what we might think about as the Olympic Games, there were stands and the crowds were cheering on these runners. And he's drawing on that analogy saying, all right, let's think about all these men and women of faith in chapter 11. And they are this cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. And we need those examples of the faith to help us to run with perseverance. Now, just so that we are biblically informed and we try to say things in the way that the Bible does, this doesn't mean that those who have died in Christ are watching us right now. At least necessarily doesn't mean that. I was thinking about this. Like, how many of y'all have seen the movie Moana? Anybody? Be proud, put them up. Yeah, I love Moana. Come on, there's no shame in Moana. I love Moana. So, Moana. So Moana's not like a Christian movie. She's not a believer in Jesus, all that. But there's a scene in Moana that I think is what a lot of people think all humans are like because her grandmother means a lot to her. And then there's a scene where her grandmother comes back to encourage her after she is dead. And so the spirit of the movie is like, the spirit of my grandmother is leading me to do these things. And sometimes we say those things, I think very well-meaning, but just just so that our words line up with the revelation of God's word. The Bible never talks about our dead relatives in Christ speaking to us, encouraging us, even watching us. I think we say that in a well-meaning way, like my dad died and he's watching me right now and he's proud of me. And I I think that sounds great, just the Bible doesn't talk about believers in that way. Now there are times, like on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus pulls up Moses and Elijah and they make an appearance, but those are exceptional occasions. Now, what I think this text is, is talking about is not that those who have died in the Lord are now watching us, but he's saying that we can learn so much from the examples of those who have gone before. This cloud of witnesses are both the dead and maybe in the alive examples of people who have walked in the ways of Jesus. That's why it's so important that we read the scriptures. In fact, if you're a, you know, if if you're not, I don't know if you're new to the Bible or not, I I would encourage you, maybe this summer this is a project you could do. You know, I'm looking at students over here, this would be great for you, it'd be great for anybody in the whole room. Pick out a character or two and spend your summer delving into the life of that person, whether it's Moses or Esther, Joshua, Read everything you can about that person, all the Bible verses, anything you get your hands on. Learn the principles from their life. Learn from what they did that was great. Learn from their mistakes. 
This is one of the reasons we read the scriptures to learn from the examples. We need, we need these witnesses that have gone before that we can emulate their example. We also need people today in the present life. If you are a runner and keep up with running, you probably know the name Eliud Kipchoge. And this guy is amazing. Now, most of us never heard of it because most of us aren't really into running, but this guy did the unthinkable. About three years ago in Vienna, I think that's where it was, he broke the two-hour barrier for the marathon. Can you imagine that? Running under two hours, 26.2 miles. And that, is that not just amazing? That, I think that equals being something like a four-minute, 50-second clip per mile. I mean, I can't even drive my car four minutes and 50 seconds a mile. This guy is unbelievable. And, and if you see the runner, what you see beside him are pacers. Now, a lot of people thought, well, this makes it illegitimate because he had these elite runners that were pacing him and keeping him on task. And I think, actually, this is a perfect description of the Christian life. We need pacers, people to watch, people to emulate, people that go with us as we run this race for journey, this journey with Jesus. We need people to keep pace. It's one reason that in recent years, we started challenging parents. You know, y'all saw a bunch of babies on the stage today, but we challenged parents that by the time your kid graduates high school, and I know parenting doesn't end after high school, I got all that, but by the time your child ends away, uh, graduates high school, here's a challenge for parents. I want you to help them have five adults not related to them, five adults that they can rely on for help, for counsel, for wisdom. One of the greatest gifts you can give to your kids are five adults that can help them be the person that Jesus wants them to be. We all need people. All right, so what's the second thing? The first is people. The second thing, if we're gonna keep pace in this race, is analysis. Now, that sounds super boring, but what's that mean? If, if you run today, you, you have all kinds of gadgets and gizmos, do you not? I mean, compared to, let's say, runners a couple of decades ago, you got watches, and these watches say all kinds of stuff. I mean, it can tell you your heart rate, it can tell you your oxygen levels, it can tell you distances and elevation gain and all this stuff. And there's all these other tools you can use to measure things like VO2 max and iron levels and iron depletion and all, all these data, all this data that you have to become a better runner. And so what it's saying is that you will never become a better runner only running by feel. Now, a lot of times when I'm running, I feel pretty fast. I feel like I'm running a four minute, 50 second mile. I'm actually running a 14 minute, 50 second mile. See, sometimes, sometimes your feelings can lie to you, right? And the same is true in your Christian life. If you're gonna really run at the pace Jesus wants you to, you've got to do a deep dive on your life and to look at it, probably needing some other people to help you look at it because you have blind spots, and to say, hey, are there areas in my life that are keeping me from running in the way Jesus wants me to? Notice in verse one, he says, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle, yours may say hindrance or weight, obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. I think we can look at this to say there's two categories here, both of which can trip us up in our running. Back in the ancient world, people had on long robes, seen the movies, Bible characters, they always have on a, a long robe, right? And so to run at your maximum capacity, you had to either take the robe off, sometimes wearing nothing at all, to run at your best. And he's saying that principle is true in your Christian life is too. You might have things, let's start with the first thing, an obstacle. Now, the thing about these obstacles, they may not be all that bad in and of themselves. These might be good things. But if we allow them to take the priority of Jesus, then these good things we allow to become God things, and then those God things can become idols or bad things in our life. For instance, uh, think about something good. Your, your career. It's a good thing to have a career. God wants us to work. We can glorify God in our work. That's awesome. Except for maybe your career, a good thing, 
can become a God thing, and it's the amount of time you spend to it in a way that it takes you from running the race that Jesus has for you in your life. It could be your phone. Phones can be good things. Right now, some of y'all are uh, looking at the Bible verses along with me, but you're also hitting a bunch of apps along the way because your mind is so conditioned to be addicted to these things. And, and your phone, which can be a good thing, can become a God thing, which can take you away from running your race. You get the point. It could be money. It could be beauty. It could, it could just be a number of things that aren't in and of themselves bad, but for you, it's a struggle that trips you up. So you gotta know what those things are, obstacles. We all have them, I have them, you have them. But then he says, not just every obstacle, but then he says, and the sin. Interesting that he uses the definite article, the sin, which so easily entangles us. I think that's a word that means something like it wraps itself around you. The thing about this that's so deceptive is that while we all struggle with sin, let me ask you a real quick question, all right? This is important. Do Christians still sin? Answer, yes. All of us sin in a number of ways all the time. But you know what's also true? If I went down the line and just kind of had each person stand up and I got in line to talk with you, I bet you all of us have two to three sins that we tend to struggle with more than the others. And what you struggle with may be different than the person beside you, maybe different than the person two rows in front of you. But all of us probably have some kind of sin that we struggle with. Remember Peter in the New Testament? He struggled so much with this fear of man. He was obsessed with what people thought about him, often in a way that would keep him from pleasing his heavenly father. I wonder what the sin is that entangles you. Is it, is it lust? Envy? Pride? Fear? We could go down the list. All of us have these sins. And this is where we need the people in our life because most of us have blind spots, but we need people who love Jesus, who lovingly can help expose those things so that we can be the mature people that we need to be. God never wants us to play around with sin. I think so many times in our culture today, even in the church, we so trivialize sin and we act like we're just victims of sin. Well, you know, I'm a broken person. I'm a messy person in a messy, broken world, which is all true. But folks, as, as a follower of Jesus, I am not a victim of sin. I'm a victor over the power and penalty of sin through Jesus. And Romans 6 tells me what my attitude towards, shit, towards sin should be. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Therefore, sin is not to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts and you are not to go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your body's parts as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under the law but under grace. Now get this right, we are still going to sin. But I am to be vigilant, depending on the Lord and his help, needing the help of others to not let any sin master over me. So I have to do an analysis of my life. So people, analysis, how about the C? This is easy in church. Christ, all right, you got, well, Jesus has to be the answer to one of them, all right, Christ. And he says in verse two, such a great verse, we run with endurance, and then we do this in verse two, looking only, only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down to the right hand of the throne of God. We talked about that on Easter Sunday. The, remember the session of Jesus, that he sits down, which is a way of saying his work is finished. But notice the process. We are to look to Jesus. That word actually means not just looking at something, but it's looking away from something else. Now, yes, human beings are great examples, and we're told in this text about this cloud of witnesses in chapter 11. That's, that's great. But our main focus should be to look to Jesus, who is the originator and perfecter of the faith. That, that word for originator, 
is the word uh, archegos. You hear the word arche, ark? Think about the first, the ruler, ark. He's saying that Jesus is the pioneer. He's the trailblazer. He's the leader. He's the perfecter of the faith. What he's saying is that Jesus is the only one who has ever perfectly submitted to and fulfilled the will of his heavenly father. Chapter 11 is filled with amazing examples of people who are great men and women of faith, but none of them, 100% of the time, fulfilled the will of God. But Jesus, 100% of the time, fulfilled the will of God, which means if you want an example to live your life, look no further than Jesus Christ. Look at the example of his life. We need the example of his life, don't we? Jesus one time said this to his followers in Matthew 4, 19. He said to them, follow me, key word, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Men and women, both people. But it starts with following me. Did you know this verse is why we named uh, our disciple-making groups, which we call 419 groups. There are a lot of different groups we do here at the church, connect groups, but 419 groups are the primary way that we see disciple-makers being formed And it starts when people get together and they have one main goal. What is it? How do we help one another follow Jesus? We need the example of his life. What did did Jesus think? Well, let's follow that. How did Jesus respond to people? Let's do that. How did Jesus react when people mistreated him? Let's do that. How did Jesus pray? Let's do that. How did Jesus share his faith? Let's do that. Whatever Jesus did, that's what we wanna do. We wanna follow Jesus in his life, but not just in his life, in his death. Notice he said in verse two that for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The cross was a shameful act. And he despised the shame. Why? For the joy that was set before him. Isn't that a crazy verse? That when Jesus went through the cross experience, what was underlying his motivation was joy. Now, I don't think there's a good example necessarily in, in human life that points to that. Maybe the closest I can think of, it'd be like when, uh, when a mother has a child. I was in a preaching conference one time, and this preacher was up there talking about the process of creating sermons, and he's like, you know, Creating a sermon is like, it's like giving birth to a child every seven days. He looked around and all the women are like. <laughs> right, because let me tell you something, brother. It ain't like giving birth to a child, all right? I've never had a child, but I promise you, it's not like having a child. And by the way, for all the young couples that are having kids, let's just be reminded, like, we are not having a baby. She is having a baby, all right? Let's just make that clear. Now, we might be raising a baby, but she is having a baby, all right? And, and the point is this that the process of of delivering the child is a painful one. But there's a joy at the end. And I don't say that to rub salt in anybody's wounds. I know for years we struggled to have kids. Some of you in the room struggle. But just as an analogy, there is a joy at the end of the pain. Jesus Christ at the end of the cross had joy, and the joy was reuniting with his Father, and the joy was reuniting you with your Heavenly Father. If you've never given your life to Jesus, can I just remind you of why Jesus died on the cross for you? He died on the cross, yes, to forgive you of your sin. He died on the cross, yes, to absolve the wrath of God. We can go on all these theological answers, but Jesus Christ died on the cross because he loves you, and it brings him great joy for you to know your heavenly father. And we're to walk, no matter what we go through, denying self and following Jesus. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16. He said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is not saying that, that we need to somehow like die on a cross for the sins of the world. We can't do that. But symbolically, every single day we are to die to my natural, fleshly, sinful desires and wants and needs. And every single day say, Jesus, this day is about you. I'm gonna take up my cross because there's a joy. He is our example. 
And if you're gonna run this race in the way God wants you to, you're gonna need people, you gotta analyze your life, but supremely you're looking at Christ. I don't know if you know the name Pastor Wang Yi, who is a Chinese pastor. He leads a church called the Early Rain Covenant Church. About four years ago, because it was an underground house church, uh, he was arrested along with most of his church members. Now, as far as I understand, most of them were released, but Pastor Yi is still imprisoned, and for all we know, being tortured and otherwise by the Chinese government. A couple of his letters have been smuggled out of prison, and in those letters, he talks about why he is disobeying the government. And this is what he says. He says, my personal disobedience, that's to the government, my personal disobedience and the disobedience of the church is not in any sense fighting for rights or political activism in the form of civil disobedience because I do not have the intention of changing any institutions or laws of China. As a pastor, the only thing I care about is the disruption of man's sinful nature by this faithful disobedience and the testimony it bears for the cross of Christ. As a pastor, my disobedience is one part of the gospel commission. Christ's great commission requires of us great disobedience. The goal of disobedience is not to change the world, but to testify about another world. You think that meant something to the Hebrews when they were being shamed by family members and losing jobs. He says, just remember Jesus. He went through something far worse, but for a joy. So we got the C, what's left? E, here I want you to write the word expectation. And when I say expectation, I say that because we need to have a clear understanding that if, if I keep my mind on Jesus, this is what will happen. And if I take my mind off of Jesus, this is what will happen. See, look in verse three. He says, for consider, take stock of, consider him, Jesus, who has, hupomone, endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Let me just pause there. He could be talking about how he was made fun of when he was crucified. But that could be said of Jesus' whole life. Born in a stable, raised in Nowheresville, Nazareth. From the day one, the most powerful man on the planet wants him dead. I mean, this, this is his life. He, he endured hostility by sinners in a sinful world. And, and why is he saying that? Because he wants to turn to those in his audience and say, but the baton is handed to you. And, and if you consider him, you will be okay, but if you lose sight of him, you know what will happen? You will grow weary and you will lose heart. That's what you should expect. Every time you take your eye off of Jesus, you will grow weary and you will lose heart. I often joke about that first race that I ran. Um, I did run other races. I haven't done it in a while. Maybe it's been a decade or so since I ran like a half marathon or something, but I remember this one race that I ran, and, and by this point, I had been training some. I knew a lot more about running. I was a much better runner. Never been a great runner, but a better runner. But I was struggling this day. Like, you ever just run a race and you're just struggling? Like, I don't know if it's because I didn't eat right or didn't manage sodium levels or it was just hot or what? I just was not doing great. But I was trying to get this certain time. And I remember it came down the last two miles and I was struggling. And so I found this guy about 50 yards in front of me and he looked like he was running about my pace, maybe a little bit more. And I just decided I'm just gonna follow that guy. So every time I wanna quit, I just would look at him and his red shirt. You know, the irony is I have no idea what the guy looks like from the front, but I can tell you what every part of the back of him looks like. Because for two miles, I just locked into this dude and whatever he did, I did. If he sped up, I sped up. I just, I just watched him and ran after him and kept looking at him. And guess what? I followed him across the finish line. And that's what Jesus wants you to do right now. He wants you to follow him across the finish line. A lot of you are weary, and I don't blame you. You're dealing with some just 
tough stuff, medical stuff, relational stuff, financial stuff. A lot of y'all are dealing with some really heavy stuff right now. It's a crazy time to be alive. And from this text, I can promise you that every single time you take your eye off of Jesus, you will grow weary and you will lose heart. But can we reverse it? The opposite expectation of this text is that the way you conquer weariness is that you keep your eye on Jesus. I love that song we sang earlier today, that that, uh, hymn of heaven. It's an unbelievable song. And I I just love that it taught, I don't have all the lyrics memorized. I just love the idea of that one day we will stand before the throne with, with all these heroes of faith saying, holy, holy is the Lord. Jesus never promised that this earth would be easy. In fact, he promised that it would be hard. The church family, I wanna encourage you, run with endurance, looking to him, the author and perfecter of our faith. I'd love to pray that over you right now. Father God, a lot of weary people in this room. And I pray, Lord, that according to what you have written in Hebrews 12, that we would look to Jesus and that we would run with endurance with his help. Father, you know where you need to comfort hearts today to be reminded of just the goodness of God. Lord, I also know there's people in this room that are not followers of Jesus. And they're not even running a race. But God, would today be the day They would surrender and repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and begin to run this race looking to you. God, I thank you for the fact that you endured the shame of the cross because of the joy that was set before you. God, we have a joy before us, the joy of heaven, the joy of eternal life with you, the joy of the new heavens, the new earth. And God, until that day, we can only just imagine. But Lord, we sing of it. There is a day that will sing to your throne. Thank you for the joy of following Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen.